My name is Ralph. Uh, this is Josh. And today we're going to be talking about the phylum Nathos tumulita. Nathos tumulita was first observed in the Baltic Sea in 1928, but it wasn't until 28 years later that their information was finally published in 1956. They were first described as being part of the phylum Platyhelminths and belonging to the class of turbularians by a German zoologist named Peter Axe. It wasn't until it was given its own phylum rank by a person named Robert Reed in 1969. Currently, there are over 80 species in about 20 genera that have been discovered so far. The name Nathos Tumulita was derived from two Greek root words, Nathos meaning the word jaw and stoma for the word mouth. They are tiny worm-like marine animals that measure about 0.5 to 1 millimeter in length. They also have a head, a neck, and a trunk. The neck region on these animals, they tend to be slightly narrower, which gives them that unique head shape they feed by scraping the bacteria and fungi from the surfaces of the wherever they are attached to. And also their respiration relies on diffusion, which is through the epithelium. Okay, Nathos tumulitas are triploblastic, which means they have three embryonic cell layers that consist of the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. They are symmetrically bilateral. They are acylomates, so they don't have a body cavity. And vermiform means that they resemble the form of a worm. They are also monolayered and monociliated, which means that each epidermal cell only has one cilium. So with that, they do a gliding movement. And one of the biggest features of the Nathus tumulita is their unique jaws, which are also lateral to their pharynx. Guys, emphasis on the gliding movement. There are some more characteristics to the Nathus tumulids. The first characteristic that I want to add is the cleavage is spiral and development is direct, meaning that it will be born as a smaller version of an adult and eventually reach its adult form. The next bullet point is that they are delicate animals. Next is that they inhabit marine and interstitial environments. And we'll get more into that when we talk about the habitats that they live in. That they live in. Next is that they have an incomplete gut, which also means that they don't have a circulatory system. They have both their female and male parts, so that makes them hermaphroditic. And it also has internal fertilization process. This is an example of the Nathostomolita, and this shows the gliding movement that it has, as you can see. The first order is the Phyllospermoidians. The characteristics of them are is that the body is usually elongate. And they also have simple jaws. Lastly, their sperm is filiform. Then there is another order called the Bursovaginoidea. The Bursovaginoidea have a similar body structure to the Phyllospermoidians. They also have a complex jaw which is different from the Phyllospermoidians because they have simple jaws. Their sperm cells are called dwarf cells, or they could also be called giant conculi. All right next is the ontogeny or the life cycle of the Nathostomolids. So we're gonna talk about first the reproduction of the Nathostomolids. Since they are sistered to the or they used to be sister to the platy helmets, they have not been closely examined when it comes to their ontogeny or their life cycle. But one thing that is for sure is that sperm transfer is by copulation. 
The picture shows philospermoidian species. They lack a vagina and a bursa for sperm storage, and it seems that sperm are injected under the epidermis and then distributed throughout the body where they are stored prior to use in fertilization. On the picture, it shows a conophorelia, and most conophorelia have a permanent vagina situated dorsally behind the ovary. The vagina leads into a pouch-shaped bursa in which only a few sperm are stored. Next is the scleroparelia. They lack a permanent vagina as well, but are characterized by a bursa system consisting of a caudal rounded prebursa, which connects anteriorly to a conical bursa. All of the bursa is composed of flattened cells, which meet laterally to form crests and anteriorly to form a perforated mouthpiece through which stored sperm are channeled to the mature egg. Of a position, specifically talking about the scleroparelia, is by rupture or of the dorsal epidermis behind the ovary and bursa at the spot where a vagina might be located. The egg then becomes spherical and sticks to, the sa to sand grains. Now we're going to talk about development. Uh, development is direct. Special cleavage is present with yolk-rich zygotes undergoing gastrulation by epiboly. Epiboly is the spreading of the ectoderm. This results in a juvenile that lacks jaws but has a rudimentary pharynx. Slide is the habitat. Um, so I'm going to talk about two different species. The first species is the Nathostoma generi. These animals have been found in many parts of the world, which includes the Atlantic coast of the U.S. They tend to occupy interstitial spaces of very fine sandy coastal sediments and silt and can endure conditions of very low oxygen. The next picture is the Nathostomala paradoxa and it is a tiny member of the interstitial fauna living between either grains of sand or mud. The species in this phylum is most commonly called jaw worms. You can find them in shallow water and down to the depths of several hundred meters and it is abundant in sediments near burrows of marine polychaetes in the North Sea. Its ecology is very similar to the Nathostomala generi. For this slide, we're gonna look at a phylogeny chart to determine which phylum is closely related to Nathostomalida and why. We find that Rotifera and Micronathosaura are the two phylums that have the closest relationship due to the fact that they all have similar morphology. And one of the main characteristics they share is the way their complicated jaws develop. So they have a rod-like element to their jaws and they develop laterally to the pharynx, as you can see in the figures. Guys, I highly suggest that you take note of what the nathostomalids are closely related to. Question one. Uh, it says what phylum are closely related to the phylum Nathostomalida, and we got A. Rotifera, B. Nadaria, C. Micronathozoa, D. Mollusca, or A and C, or C and D. And the answer would be A and C. It'll be Rotifera and Micronathozoa. Next question is what kind of movement do Nathostomalids have? Do they have A, a whip-like movement? Do they have B, a side-to-side -side movement? Do they have C, a gliding movement? Or D, it is sedentary? The answer is C, gliding movement. Uh, this is the reference slide for you, Dr. Morris.